Hey guys, Garrett here, and today is part four of our DIY geothermal series. Today I'm going to cover the internal manifold system for how all of the, uh, the pipes come in from outside, how they all join, go to the pump system, and then get into your heat pump, as well as the water antifreeze mixture you're going to use. And then we're going to get into the startup procedure of this entire system. If you missed parts one, two, or three, part one was about soils, part two was about trenches, and part three was all about the penetrations going through your basement wall, your slab, all of that, basically getting those pipes into your house. There are links to all of those down in the description. As you see, I built my own manifold here and I've got these shutoff valves and all of these T's. So it's a three quarter inch out by a one inch in. And the reason that this isn't any bigger is you only need so much flow through the system going through that heat exchanger inside of your heat pump. So the reason these are nice and big is because there is actually friction inside of that pipe and that pipe is 600 feet long. So that can lead to a lot of friction along the way. So you need the increased diameter size of this to overcome all of that friction. Anyway, it all comes to this one inch. Uh, my supplier gave me this pipe right here. It was just a Continental Contec Frontier one inch pipe. It's rated up to 200 PSI, but again, this is a non-pressurized system. So I don't know, just rubber pipe is fine on this. And of course, just uh, the hose clamps, they're good to go to. All of these fittings here are basically for water wells. So they're easy to come by. I got mine either at Lowe's or at uh, Home Depot or at Menards. They're available at all of them. Same deal with the ball valves. You know, that's just a three quarter inch ball valve. I would suggest putting the ball valves on both the outgoing as well as the incoming uh, side of this, just so you can isolate this entire thing. But with that said, the pipe being right here, it is at its highest point. It goes out of the wall and then dives down. So if I have to disconnect that at all, I am gonna drain a little bit of my uh, GT flow center here, but I'm not gonna drain whatever is in those pipes right there. But regardless, I think I'd still suggest putting it on both sides, put ball valves on each side of it. You can also use pre-manufactured manifold systems that uh, I think are generally made out of PVC, but they're going to be insulated. And again, there's another tip. I should have all of these insulated because these lines can sweat. So I would suggest insulating your lines. But anyway, the manifold itself, it's gonna be, I think it's made out of PVC. It's got the shutoffs all within it and it is insulated to start with. Uh, there's a link down in the description from Amazon. They're actually reasonably priced. Or you can just make your own just out of PVC. Remember, all you're putting in this is uh, water and some sort of antifreeze. So it's not a real corrosive uh, fluid that's going through it. So you can get creative as to how you make these manifold systems. And then of course, if you don't want to make your own manifold system, you just buy it and it's not that terribly expensive and it'll probably save you some time. This port right here, you can see one right here. These are temperature ports so you can stick your thermometer through right there. It should be on both of these, but I only had so much of this hosing. So I ended up putting it right here on my GT flow center. And the main reason was I didn't need a 90 degree coming out of, out of my heat pump here. I just wanted a straight leg. So it just goes up into there. And then you can see that's where the temperature port is. Again, I would suggest having it at the unit if you can just buy more of this pipe. I guess I got cheap or I didn't know exactly what I was doing at the time, but you know, you learn as you go. So you need these temperature ports so that you can tell what the difference is of the incoming water temperature versus the outgoing water temperature. And the reason is these pumps over here, at least with this GT flow center, they are multi-speed pumps. They're three speed pumps. So you can have low, medium and high and you want to experiment with uh, how fast it's pumping the fluid through so that you can get the correct uh, delta between those two, uh, the incoming and the outgoing. 
uh, your heat pump manufacturer is going to have a recommended range that your temperature needs to stay within. So mine most of the time is between 6 and 12 degrees. If it is less than that, it means that your fluid is going way too fast through that heat exchanger. You need to slow down the velocity of the fluid going through that heat exchanger, which means going, say, from high to medium or medium to low on those pumps. I really like these GT flow centers because it creates a system that is non-pressurized. Plus, it's all in one. So it's got the tank, it has the pumps, it's got the shutoff, so there's a shutoff there and a shutoff right there. So if the pump ever goes bad, I can isolate those, pull the pumps out, and then replace them. But like I said, non-pressurized, you just spin off this top and you can see inside, uh, that's where the liquid goes. These are fairly expensive, uh, but you know, you get what you pay for. You can put together another system that's totally closed if you wanted to with a pump and then you would need an expansion tank and you'd probably have some pressure buildup within the system, but these really simplify everything. Just make sure that the top of your GT flow center is at the top of your system. Again, non-pressurized system. So this top has to be at the top of the system to get all of the air out of that system. Speaking of air, as you can see right here, I put a cap right at the top of the system. Now its main purpose is just to initially fill the system with all of the fluid. Uh, once everything, the lines and everything are filled, you just put that cap back in place and then you resume filling in that, uh, that GT flow center. At which point you can cycle on and off to get the rest of the air out of the system. And when you do cycle that on and off, I would say don't have the actual heat pump system going at the same time. Just cycle it, wire it in a way that you can flip a breaker on for a little bit suck the fluid down, turn it off, add more fluid, and then do that again and again until you don't have a drop anymore in fluid. And with that said, your heat pump system is going to have a procedure uh, that is prescribed for how to do this whole thing, as well as the GT flow center. It actually has some procedures to go with it, but it's basically what I just explained. Once you have the liquid in the system, you want to actually let this GT flow center run continuously for probably 24 hours. It's going to get all the little bubbles and just residual air out of the system. Once the air is out of the system, you're ready to fire the entire thing up. When it comes to the antifreeze water mixture, this is actually what I use for the antifreeze. It is propylene glycol, inhibited propylene glycol. So it's specifically made for these types of systems. I got this from my supplier of my heat pump system, but if you look at this, it'll tell you exactly what the freeze protection is at the different volumes that you have. When I was doing my system, I actually ran out. I needed a little bit more. I ended up with roughly uh, one third polypropylene to uh, two thirds water whenever I did it. But I ran out, so I went to Menards and I got this Cryotech 100. And again, it's the same thing. It's a, a inhibited propylene glycol and it has freeze protections that are basically the same as what that uh, freeze control over there is. With your antifreeze mixture, you're going to want a certain percentage of that antifreeze to that water mixture. And your heat pump manufacturer is probably gonna have a minimum that you use for a closed loop system. Well, that uh, for mine at least, the Bosch unit, it was a minimum of 20% uh, of that antifreeze to that water mixture. And the main reason for that is freeze protection and that antifreeze is inhibited and has corrosion uh, inhibitors within it. So it's gonna actually protect the system as well as your pumps. The actual mixture that you use is going to be very specific to your region. So you're gonna to wanna to talk to your supplier about that, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, or even higher percent of that antifreeze to that water mixture. The water that you wanna put into that system, according to the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, is going to be demineralized water. The antifreeze that you're going to use, there's lots of different things that you can use with this. The most common is 
propylene glycol. Or you can have an alcohol-based antifreeze to water mixture. It's just dependent upon what you want as well as what your supplier has to give you. And then again, it's also dependent upon the jurisdiction that you're in. They may recommend or require specific things dependent upon where you live. The only time you're going to be using an antifreeze solution is going to be with a closed loop system. And of course, that's what I'm focused on with this series of videos. As I noted, I have that GT Flow Center, and of course you're going to have to wire that into your system so that it comes on any time that your compressor comes on. So I don't know how you wanna do that. That's dependent upon, again, your jurisdiction as well as your electrician. Uh, they'll figure out a way to do it, but basically it, it's probably going to be something that connects into the contactor that is within your heat pump system. Anytime that contactor closes, that compressor comes on, and at the same time, your pump needs to be on. So whether they're putting that directly into that, uh, that contactor or they are running it through a relay that is connected to that contactor, that's all dependent upon them. Just make sure that that pump comes on at least at the same time that that compressor is on. You do not want your compressor running and the pump not running. You don't need a delay in there. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to hit that like button down below as well as subscribe. And stay tuned for the next video, which is gonna be all about the slinky loop system. I'm gonna show you how to actually tie those slinky loops together the correct way. I'll see you next time.